Welcome, I'm Martin Red Khan, host of the Democracy Forum at TMU, where we try to do democracy differently. A special welcome if you're watching us on the CPAC television network or live on the star.com. Our guest today is Immigration Minister Sean Fraser. Before I formally introduce him, I'd like to formally acknowledge that Toronto Metropolitan University is on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, Haudenosaunee, and other Indigenous peoples who were here long before we had any immigration to speak of or a Minister of Immigration to talk about. Now, before I introduce the Minister, it's also my job to tell you a bit about myself first. I write a political column for the Toronto Star, Canada's biggest and best newspaper, but in my uh, other life, I'm a visiting practitioner here in the Faculty of Arts at TMU and founder of the Democracy Forum. In my spare time, I'm at the Monk School as well as a senior fellow, but in my previous life, I was a foreign correspondent for about a 11 years covering conflict uh, and wars around the world and therefore coming face to face with refugees who were stuck in camps around the world and also immigrants who were talking all the time about coming to Canada. So this is a subject near and dear to my heart. And today we're gonna hear from the politician in charge of Canada's juggling act. So let me tell you about our guest. Sean Fraser has been the Federal Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship since 2021. He's also the MP from Central Nova. He's a graduate of Dalhousie Law School, specialized in international dispute resolution. And he also has a master's in public international law from Leiden University in the Netherlands and a BSc from St. Francis Xavier University. Minister, welcome to TMU. I should admit that I also went to Dalhousie University, so I'm feeling a bit nostalgic, but uh, you're not our first cabinet minister from Nova Scotia at the Democracy Forum because Anita Anand, the Minister of Defense, beat you to it. I look right, at your mind and thank you for having me. And I should point out that one of my colleagues who's the member of parliament for the area is also a graduate of TMU, uh, Marcy Ian. So if Marcy's tuning in, uh, hello, it's good to be on your old stomping grounds, albeit virtually. Yep, and she did work in Nova Scotia and she did beat you to it as well because she was on the Democracy Forum <laughs> last month. So you're in last place today. All right, there's a lot of interest on campus about your appearance today because TMU is home to the Center for Immigration and Resettlement Studies. And more recently, TMU won the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration, as I'm sure you know. So it's only fitting that I should be joined by the chair herself as my co-host today, Professor Anna Trandafelidou. She is an internationally recognized sociologist and migration policy expert who came to TMU in 2019. She's held distinguished research and, and teaching positions in Greece, Italy, the UK, and the US. She's a former Fulbright scholar and was Robert Schumann chair at the European University Institute where she got her PhD. She's also editor in chief of the Journal of Immigrant and Refugee Studies. So I'm surrounded by editors in my life. Anna, welcome to the Democracy Forum. Thank you, very nice to join you today. All right, some quick housekeeping. We've agreed to first names only today, so there'll be no uh, formal ministerial titles uh, for you, Sean. You're still honorable, uh, but we're not gonna keep calling you that. And um, we'll be opening it up to the audience for questions at the midpoint. If you're on Zoom, if you're watching on Zoom, you can use the chat function uh, online. Don't forget to include your name so we can give you a shout out when we read out your questions. So. Start thinking up your thoughts and questions now. Okay, I always remind people that this is not a news conference or a confrontation or question period. This is a democracy forum where we try to dig a little deeper and try to get more in-depth answers. So let's try to have a, a discussion that really gets the minister off of talking points and, and talking, uh, talking straight. So I'm gonna kick things off. Uh, Sean, you're uh, you're always on the hot seat in question period, and uh, so I'm going to start with an with an icebreaker just just to warm you up. So, as I said, it's a democracy forum. A lot of us are interested in the politics of immigration and refugee policy, which underpins everything you do. It's a humanitarian issue. It's about economics and the labor force and and law and fairness. Um, but at the end of the day, if you don't have a social consensus among the electorate, among Canadians who 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 choose the next government and your government, uh, then everything you do kind of falls apart and you would not be able to bring in 500,000 people a year, which is your, your target in a couple of years. So the question is to start is, how do you keep Canadians on side? How do you get buy-in from people? Um, 
Look, I think the it's a really important question because it's an enormous competitive advantage uh, from an economic and social point of view, in my perspective, uh, that Canada has that really is uh, unique in the world. Um, and I think it's important to understand the international context if you're going to figure out what separates Canada. And I always get a kick out of it when I travel internationally. And John McCallum, one of my predecessors, uh, used to, to say this, and I always thought it was a joke. Uh, but my experience has been that um, my counterparts around the world are, are stunned uh, that the greatest political challenge that I have in Canada as the immigration minister is that I can't welcome newcomers quickly enough to satisfy the demand of communities, whether you're talking about employers, whether you're talking about volunteer groups who have put their hand up to say they want to help respond to a humanitarian crisis, or of course, families who want to be uh, reunified with their loved ones. Um, there's not one secret ingredient, in my view, that maintains public support for immigration. It's a mix of different factors. Uh, first and foremost, I think Canadians understand the uh, not just the value that immigration provides, but the necessity of immigration to our economic well-being. Uh, about a third of the doctors in this country uh, came from somewhere else, about a quarter of the nurses came from somewhere else. And when you're having your appendix removed, you don't really care about where the surgeon came from. You care about their ability to remove your appendix safely. Um, what I've seen um, in my own home community in rural Nova Scotia has been eye-opening uh, for the public support behind immigration because we were living through the counterfactual, which is a devastating set of circumstances if you don't embrace immigration. In my first campaign back in 2015, two of the real hot issues in my community were the closure of a local elementary school and the loss of the mental health unit at the Aberdeen Hospital, the biggest regional hospital in Northern Nova Scotia. And the school closed because families moved out of rural Nova Scotia, as has been the case for many generations. The hospital closed because a psychiatrist moved and we couldn't safely operate it with the one who remained. Um, people saw that the consequences of a shrinking community meant we couldn't count on public services that we always took for granted. Uh, thank you. Well, let, let me just let me just jump in there because because I, I see what you're talking about. There's no question that in in less populated parts of Ontario or or Canada or Nova Scotia, I remember when Doug Ford said, you know, we got to look after our people first when he was first campaigning for the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party. He was talking to northern mayors and he was met by by stunned silence because in northern Ontario, they're not worried about people stealing jobs. They're worried about people filling jobs. So I get that. But then there's the static and there's the there's the let's let's be candid here that people who are interested in immigration and refugee issues who are probably watching this democracy forum today are motivated and, and you don't, you're preaching to the converted here. I'm talking about people who aren't watching today and who are watching critics in question period or on the campaign trail, which I've seen over the years, who are trying to stir things up. So how do you, how do you guard against the kind of backlash that might come? We'll talk about rocks and road in a few minutes. So let's not go there yet. But how do you guard against the backlash that can come from out of nowhere? Uh, you introduce people to newcomers. Uh, it's not that complicated to me. Um, I, in, in my, and I draw a lot of my, my perspective on my own community. Uh, but if I look um, at the fishing community of Lismore, Nova Scotia, uh, just 10 minutes down the road from where I grew up, some of the biggest proponents of immigration are the guys who've been fishing for generations because they know their supply chain depends on newcomers to process their product, to transport their product, and to get it into markets where they get a higher price. If you were to pull out uh, our immigration programs, the East Coast fishery would sink, and the community knows that. There's a long-standing baseball tournament in Lismore that has teams of families who've been there for 13, 14, 15 generations. There's now a team from Mexico that put an entry in last year for the first time, and Curtis, who I went to high school with, who would not have been a supporter of immigration when we were buddies back in high school, is out there cheering them on, speaking Spanish on the sidelines. The reality is it's transformed communities. It's injected life into communities. And my sense is that people have long ago uh, ditched the perspective that newcomers are coming to compete with them for jobs, but are instead filling key gaps in the economy that allows those who've been in communities for generations to continue to work. The reality okay, is- but for, the, for those of us who are not in, in rural Nova Scotia, and I do miss Nova Scotia, your, your ministry does public opinion research and that you see polls that others do publicly. Do you see any warning signs there? Um, n no, I, I think we, we constantly have to monitor what the public mood is. And the last thing that we want to do is start a partisan fight over whether immigration is, is good or bad. Uh, Canadians, by and large, think we are welcoming 
either the right level or not quite enough uh, uh, permanent residents each year when I look at the public opinion data. Um, and that's across the partisan spectrum, by the way, and I think I'm, I'm very, very thankful for that. Uh, Canadians do want to see that we maintain integrity in our immigration system. There are Francophone communities who are not opposed to immigration, but want to see that we continue to welcome Francophone newcomers so the demographic weight of Francophones are protected, so they see a future of themselves in the future of Canada. So there are all kinds of issues you need to manage to make sure that our immigration system is not just supported, but actually works for the people who are here now. And as long as we can build in uh, an opportunity for communities and for people to see themselves living alongside newcomers, uh, I don't see that the public support for immigration is threatened. I think the appetite is actually bigger than we've been able to meet. We just have to do it in the right way. And uh, that's something that we're going to keep working on. Okay. Anna, over to you. Yes. Thank you very much, Minister. Yes, for this very positive um, you know, start. Um, I would like to ask you, um, in following up from Martin's question, do you feel that the Canadian migration narrative is becoming too instrumental? It's about, you know, us, like the country growing, you know, our GDP growing, but we're losing the dimension of values that we had? Um, look, I, I don't I don't see that. Uh, re the reality is that um, uh, immigration is not just something that we do in Canada. It's, it's who we are. It's, it's, it's who we've always been. And uh, the reality that I've seen over the course of my life is that our immigration ambition as a country has continued to grow more rapidly in recent years than uh, historically. And newcomers who move into our communities, in my experience, have um, uh, in part moved to Canada because of the values that we've always espoused and integrate uh, fairly successfully in Canada compared to many other countries in the world. Um, certainly, we want to continue to educate people about uh, their rights, their responsibilities as a newcomer, as a, as a citizen, uh, but the embrace of diversity is part of uh, the Canadian values. And this spirit of multiculturalism and diversity, in my view, is strengthened by immigration. So it's, it's a natural fit for Canada, given our history of uh, welcoming immigrants over the course of, uh, well, since long before Canada was a country. And uh, I think that's unique in the world because we don't ne necessarily have that ethnic nationalist history that many other countries in the world do. And it makes it easier in Canada for us to continue to welcome newcomers from different parts of the world than some of our counterparts on the global stage. Uh, I'll go, I'll jump in here if I can, just to change gears now that we've warmed you up. Uh, the journalist in me, and I know Anna's keen to ask, talk about this as well, uh, needs to jump on the latest news. The talking point is uh, Roxham Road. And you were just, you just made your own journey to Washington this month where you met your counterpart. You have the US president coming here to meet the prime minister in just a couple of weeks. Um, but you came back from Washington, with, unsurprisingly, without any commitments. This has been a long standing debate uh, and, and, and discussion. But you, I was struck that you came back with uh, kind of a reminder to Canadians that we need to deal with root causes, that we need to deal with holistic solutions. And you're right, but that's going to take a long time. And, and getting a holistic solution for Haiti has taken forever and will probably take a long time, right? You can talk to the Minister of Defense and Foreign Affairs about Haiti. And if you're talking about Latin America, the flows are increasing, not decreasing, and, and attempts to fix root causes are a long-term project. So what do you say to uh, the opposition and, and parliament and to people who, who just can't get their heads around what is effectively or de facto an open border on a, on a pathway, even though there are all kinds of explanations for it. Uh, if all you have is, is just keep waiting, how do you fix that political challenge you face right now? Uh, well, you keep working on it. Um, the reality is that the situation at uh, Roxham Road is, is not just a, uh, a political challenge. It's something that uh, is a real, very real and substantive challenge on the ground that we've needed to address because uh, it's a social reality that, that people have been crossing the border in a different way, uh, and we need to uh, treat people with respect and make good on our both Canadian and international legal obligations. Uh, but we also need to uh, demonstrate to Canadians that the process of immigration to Canada is one that has integrity, that uh, is clear. And so uh, people who are thinking about making a journey to Canada understand there are real opportunities for them to come through regular channels uh, and not simply just across at, at Roxham Road. So 
to back it up, I think it's really important when we talk about addressing the root causes um, that we're simultaneously trying to address the acute situation at Roxham Road, the more uh, broad circumstances uh, across the Canada-US border from one coast to the other, and uh, 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 doing two things at once is is a necessity when it comes to governance. Um, so as we seek to- okay, but so, so if there's if there's two things, what's the second thing? So if the first, the first thing is long-term, understandable oh, it, uh, then then how do you how do you show progress when there's obviously an inexorable increase happening so I, I think there's a couple of different things that we do one we we have been working towards uh, a strength and safe third country agreement with the united states my trip to washington uh we were not expecting to we didn't have a an agreement signing ceremony scheduled uh but it was a very productive use of my time from my point of view and uh, the secretary, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I expect he would say the same. Um, this is going to take a little bit of time to uh, uh, continue to uh, reach an agreement that's not designed to respond to the challenges that are apparent over the next few weeks, uh, but designed to uh, address challenges that will continue to be apparent over the next number of generations if we don't deal with this now. So this is a long-term uh, solution that we're looking for uh, with the United States. And I, I was very pleased with the uh, the nature of our conversation because we have an excellent partner with the United States. In addition to dealing with the situation at the border, we also need to make sure that within Canada, uh, we're dealing with the challenge of having had uh, 39,000 people last year uh, cross into Canada in an irregular way. Uh, we're doing that in the immediate term by working with communities that have the capacity to uh, provide the very basics for people, a roof over someone's head, for example. Uh, so we are treating people with basic dignity and respect, and we're working to collect information about what competencies people may have to plug them into opportunities so they can transition to supporting themselves more quickly. So those are the short and medium term things dealing with the circumstances within Canada and at the border. But we have to constantly be working on the long-term challenge, which is the root cause of irregular migration, whether that's building capacity with the nonprofit sector and civil society actors in source countries, or whether that's uh, advertising the regular pathways, which we are still hungry to recruit people through. I'm thinking, for example, um, the temporary foreign worker program. When I met with yeah, my but before, before you, but before you shift, let's let's stay on Roxham Road for a minute. So I'm sure Anna has a follow up as well, but. But you could also just suspend the agreement. I mean, it's not working. It's, it's, it's effectively dysfunctional now. Why not suspend the agreement and let people just come through regular ports of entry? Or are you just afraid that you'll get many more people? Um, so I, I don't think suspending the agreement is a, a workable solution uh, for a number of reasons. I think uh, one, uh, although you might see more traffic at, at points of entry, uh, if your challenge is not just where people are crossing, but the fact that many people are crossing, it's not going to fix that challenge. In fact, I do expect you would see an uptick in the number of people who make asylum claims after crossing into Canada if you suspended the Safe Third Country Agreement. So I would not suggest that it, it provides no value now. I think there are challenges with it that we need to overcome, and I think that's pretty clear given uh, what's uh, transpired over the last number of months. Um, but the other piece that not enough people are talking about is the dangerous journey that people take to come to Canada or to the United States is not just apparent at the border. There are people who are making life-changing, dangerous decisions for themselves and their family throughout the entire path along their migration journey. We should not be creating incentives that uh, encourage people to uproot their lives, to flee very challenging circumstances that's going to place them in danger. To the extent that we can communicate that there will be a safe third country agreement, and that's a principle that I support, is that you should be free to seek refuge in communities or in countries that where you are, are fleeing violence, war, or persecution, danger to yourself or to your family, but we should do it in an, uh, an orderly way wherever possible and not encourage people to make extremely long and potentially very dangerous journeys. By regularizing the situation, uh, not just at Roxham Road, but uh, across the entirety of the Canada-US border, uh, we'll be able to not only reduce the number of people who come to make asylum claims that would have been safe to do so in another country, but we'll discourage people from making that decision to make an extremely long and perilous journey for themselves and their loved ones. Okay, Anna, over to you. Um, uh, Minister, I very much appreciate the, um, your complex thinking, uh, although I suppose you're not a migration researcher, and it's definitely, as you say, that people have very good reasons for leaving their countries. Um, I'm afraid they prefer this hopeful uncertainty towards the hopeless certainty that they have in their countries, and we shouldn't forget that the people leaving 
you know, are not the poorest of the poor. They are actually usually people with significant resources that can make, like even just to imagine the strip, let alone plan it and and, and make it. But I do appreciate what, what you say about the short, the medium, and the long term. And, and, and this is very much how we're thinking researchers. I want to go to a separate but also related issue. We know in the mandate letter there is a plan for addressing people without status that live today in Canada. And although many people would have thought, oh, Canada is far removed geographically from regions that are producing um, you know, uh, asylum seekers and, say, irregular migrants, we do know generally, in fact, that people generally come here with documents legally, but we also know that they sometimes fall through the cracks. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what are your plans for uh, a new regularization program? Also, because we know in the past we have had such programs, but usually they were very limited in scope. And people were, you know, in like near 1,000 for le less than 1,000 construction workers in Ontario, 2,000 people. I mean, even the Guardian Angels was 1,300, but I hope we're looking into a more uh, encompassing and more ambitious program this time. Um, look, thank you for for raising the issue. And uh, and look, uh, I, uh, I hesitate to get out uh, in front of decisions that have not yet been taken uh, to broadcast um, exactly where the uh, the future may take us. But I'm considering more encompassing versions of uh, regularization programs for undocumented workers uh, as we speak. And we're looking to make good on that mandate letter commitment. Uh, which is framed in the terms of uh, expanding beyond the existing regularization programs, uh, like the construction workers pilot that you mentioned, like the Guardian Angels program, which both, as you pointed out, were limited in scope, but I think provided excellent examples of the value that Canada can receive by bringing people out of the shadows and allowing them to live in our communities and receive uh, uh, benefits and have work opportunities that allow them to better support themselves. Uh, and for, uh, this is obviously a very sophisticated audience, uh, but for those who may not be following the issue, um, the projections uh, are as high as uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people who are in Canada that currently don't have status. And when you don't have status, you have an inability to work. You can't receive many public services. And there's a certain level of basic human dignity and respect that people go without um, because they're hiding uh, for fear of being deported. Uh, we're looking at different options right now to understand what we will be able to do to provide an opportunity for those people to come join the economy and stop working underneath the table, which will also not just give an opportunity for people to improve their career prospects, but give an opportunity for them to contribute and to pay taxes and receive the services that will allow them to, uh, to, to be well. Um, there's a lot of thinking that goes into this policy development process. Uh, how many people are we talking about? Uh, should we be focused initially on uh, people who have family members they need to be with? Should we be focused on people who are working currently in a labor shortage context? Um, with an unknown number of people who will step forward to make a claim, how can we ensure our processing resources are in place so we can offer people a pathway to permanent residency in a timely way? These are all questions that I'm personally considering uh, right now to understand what the path forward may look like. Uh, we don't have an announcement scheduled over the next few days uh, uh, or, or certainly during our event today, uh, but trying to get feedback from Canadians on what the design of a path uh, should look like to provide permanent residency to those people who've been living in our communities in some instances for many years, who often have Canadian citizens that are children, uh, their children that are Canadian citizens, uh, and who are wanting to make a difference uh, is the kind of thing that I feel compelled to do. Uh, and uh, I think I've been given the license by the Prime Minister in my mandate letter uh, to move forward, but the details are something we're working on uh, presently. Well, we still have 30 minutes, so you're welcome to make the announcement before before the, the, the show is over. Um, there's an old saying in politics that, that foreign policy is really domestic policy. And you could also argue that refugee, especially immigration policy, is also driven by domestic diasporas or, or domestic uh, considerations, special interests. So you, you take a lot of heat sometimes about the fact that we've let in so many Ukrainians with the war in Ukraine and we are throttling the number of Haitians coming through Roxham Road, or that we've opened it up for Hong Kongers because of the democracy situation challenge over there. Uh, there you're, there's always people pointing to this, and you're gonna tell me that that's never a consideration. So my question to you is, how do you avoid becoming captive of domestic diasporas when you're trying to set your own priorities for special considerations? 
Um, you know, I've received some uh, some good advice uh, uh, over the last uh, few years from a uh, an unlikely source, um, as someone who's become a bit of a friend over the course of the past few years as former Prime Minister uh, Brian Mulroney. And uh, what he communicated to me uh, upon my appointment to cabinet was a message he uh, he said that he left with his ministers when he was sworn into the prime minister's office. Uh, and he said, um, uh, concern yourself only with what serves the long term interests of Canada. And if you've satisfied yourself at the end of the day that the decisions you take meet that outcome, you're going to sleep very well. And at the end of your career, you'll be very pleased with your accomplishments. Uh, when I think about uh, what policies we adopt, whether it's the um, uh, response to Ukraine, whether it's a situation at Roxham Road, whether it's the uh, overall immigration ambition, I'm trying to figure out um, what's not just going to help the labor shortage uh, today, what's going to help us address the long-term skills gap that exists in the, the Canadian economy. On humanitarian issues, this is one I struggle with because there are so many vulnerable people in the world who would be well served by having a place in Canada. Uh, but when I think about the um, disproportionate response uh, compared to many other countries in the world, uh, when I look at um, Afghanistan or Ukraine, uh, I think to myself, in the case of Afghanistan, we're dealing with a group of people who uh, Canada counted on uh, during our, our time. Uh, and it makes sense to me uh, that we communicate to the world forever and a day that we're going to have an outsized refugee resettlement program when we count on you for assistance when the Canadian forces show up uh, on a, a mission of, of global importance. With respect to Ukraine, uh, we discussed this during the Prime Minister's visit to uh, Nova Scotia this morning. Um, one of the things that people may not appreciate is certainly there are vulnerable people who fled Ukraine. But when we saw millions of people leaving, uh, what was under attack was not just their homeland, but values that we care about in Canada, sovereignty, mm -hmm. territorial integrity, self-determination. These are values that have delivered peace and prosperity to Canada for the better part of, of the past century. And if we don't uh, put our money where our mouth is, uh, when, uh, when it comes time to respond to uh, a crisis of this scale, uh, then I don't think we're meeting uh, our own expectations, let alone the expectations of any given diaspora community in Canada. Um, so it's uh, it, obviously you respond to feedback that comes in from this corner of the country or that corner of the country. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're satisfied that what a particular community is asking for is actually in the long term interests of Canada, um, then I think at the end of the day, you'll be pretty happy with the decisions that you take. OK, uh, I think I'm guessing you have a, 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 a you just drop references to St. Francis Xavier University and you get Brian Mulroney to, to return the call, uh, given his connection to that campus as well. But I think you could summarize summarize it as uh, good government is good politics is is a motto, but I'm not sure everyone always follows it. Um, I will say that the prime minister, when he was in power and I covered him, was made sure Canada was the first country to recognize Ukraine uh, diplomatically uh, at the time. And it was the right thing to do. Um, so you've talked a lot about Nova Scotia. When I went to Nova Scotia for university, it was very white. It's not that white anymore. But I'd like to talk about, because you, since you keep mentioning that your, your home province, um, the challenge when you bring in 500,000 immigrants, which is the target for 2025, and it's gone from 400,000 to 500,000 on your watch, that's a 25% increase. Um, I keep hearing our premier, Doug Ford, not complaining, but using that as an excuse to cut up the green belt, if you can believe it, because he argues, well, we're getting 500,000 immigrants a year, roughly half will, if not more, will settle in the greater Toronto area. Therefore, we need to carve up the green belt. We need to build houses like crazy. So without getting into a Doug Ford digression, um, there is often a worry that there's too much of a good thing. So how do you, how do you, uh, and, and also that there's, that we're keeping too much of that in the GTA. So how do you, because people have talked about this forever. How do you make people, persuade people, encourage people to go to Nova Scotia, Northern Ontario, the North, uh, and other parts of the, of the country that are depopulating? How do you make them stay there? How do you persuade them to stay there? Uh, look, there's not a silver bullet, but we need to address this issue. And, and look, for what it's worth, I obviously disagree that um, there's one particular area that you would need to build out housing to serve uh, newcomers, given the vast uh, swaths of space that we have available. Uh, right. but, but there are very real challenges that particular communities are facing. And I should say as well that this is not driven just by our permanent residency uh, targets, I would say far less so. I think our temporary programs, if I look at the expanse, expansion to the international student programs, 
program or a temporary workers program have a, a greater pressure being added than I would suggest even our permanent residency programs. So there's a couple of things that I think are really important that we've tried to be more thoughtful about this past year than over the course of Canada's history to promote the regionalization of immigration to Canada. Uh, first of all, uh, we should recognize that of that 500,000, year to year, it might be close to half uh, of the number of people that are settling as permanent residents are actually already living here as temporary residents. Um, they don't add pressure to the uh, housing sector if they already have a home and are living here. They don't take a job from anyone if they're already living and working here. And as we discussed, my view is even if you come from a third country, you're probably protecting jobs of Canadians by adding value rather than taking it from them. But specifically on the area of regionalization, there's some real success that we've had over the past few years on this front. Uh, the fastest two growing cities in Canada last year were Moncton and Halifax. Uh, we've been pushing people through regionalized programs, whether it's the rural and northern immigration pilot, the expanding Atlantic immigration program, increased numbers in the past immigration levels plan that are going up by 44% to the provincial nominee programs to spread people more equitably across the country. And I'm very excited that later this year, we intend to deploy a new uh, tool for the first time, which is going to uh, turn the uh, a very powerful express entry system, which operates as a very powerful but blunt instrument into a more precise tool through a category-based selection mechanism that will allow us to select people through that system uh, by leveraging the score that they receive uh, to identify the best and brightest, but defining the pool of people by sector and by region. To the extent that we can better push people to communities that have capacity, whether it's in Atlantic Canada, Northern Ontario, parts of the prairies, or other parts of the country that are not our biggest urban centers, we're going to be able to share the benefits of immigration and reduce pressures in certain pockets. In addition, we need to be tailoring our immigration system to help reduce the pressure in some of those areas where people feel it most. I'm thinking in particular housing and healthcare. Uh, look at any community in this country. We got labor shortages and housing needs. Uh, when I sit down next to Ahmed Hussein, uh, we, we in the House of Commons, he sits immediately to my left. I always uh, joke with him that are you going to be able to build enough houses for all the newcomers that we're bringing? And he says, it depends. Can you bring enough newcomers with the skills we need to build them? Part of the solution to alleviating the pressure on the housing sector will be bringing in skilled tradespeople who can build more homes. Part of the solution to our healthcare human resources pressure is going to be bringing in people who have the skills necessary to provide care rather than add pressure to the system. There's no one uh, solution to this, but by bringing in the right people and creating incentives and programs that drive them to parts of the country that are outside of our biggest urban environments, I'm confident that the long-term plan will allow us to do this in a sustainable way and continue to experience growth. Okay, I like that you keep talking about the long-term. That's unusual for politicians. Uh, let's go to the questions from the, from the floor, as it were, that are coming in on Zoom. A reminder to folks to, to send us your questions and uh, add your name. This person has a great question, but did not include his or her name, but I love the question. Uh, do you see Canada and the world establishing a climate refugee program to deal with those fleeing due to global warming consequences? People don't talk about it much now, but I really see that uh, up ahead. What do you think about that? Um, so I've, I've had this conversation with the High Commissioner of uh, UNHCR, and one of the things that I think it's important to realize is that people who are displaced and vulnerable as a result of climate-related disasters now can find refuge in Canada based on their vulnerability, but we don't necessarily target groups based on the reason that they have fled. Um, for example, uh, one of the things that Mr. Grandi pointed out when we were asked this question at a press conference uh, was uh, whether the questioner realized that uh, many of the wars that have uh, displaced people that have led to their resettlement in Canada and elsewhere around the world are actually driven by climate-related resource shortages. If there is a drought and precious resources cause uh, different factions who are at uh, uh, war with one another to uh, uh, make a community unlivable, um, some of the people who are displaced will eventually make their way into a refugee-like program. It's one of the things that I want to be careful that we don't start uh, selecting people who might be displaced but are not as vulnerable as others. 
Uh, and I think we need to make sure that the, the guiding principle for refugee resettlement is protecting the vulnerable, regardless of their region for being displaced. This could include climate-related disasters, uh, but it might uh, include uh, uh, violence, war, persecution, uh, and some of these factors could be intertwined. I think more recently, we're looking at how to continue to respond to the situation with a natural disaster in uh, Syria and, and Turkey with the recent earthquake, uh, not just by creating refugee programs, but expediting applications that are in the system now and looking at what more we can do to bring families close to their loved ones who might have been impacted. So yes, this is going to be part of the future discussion. Whether it needs a carved out, dedicated set of spaces for refugee resettlement, I think is a separate question because I would rather build in people based on their vulnerability into the numbers that we have more that would allow us to help more people who are affected by climate-related displacement events uh, rather than saying we'll do 200 spaces this year for climate refugees, when in fact we might be able to help thousands who are displaced uh, by virtue of a mix of climate and social factors. Okay, but just a very quick follow-up to that person's question before we go to Anna for her list. Uh, and that is, um, sure, you, you're not gonna, you're, it's differentiating is hard. Another way of asking the question is, do you personally, when you're thinking about the, the long-term, believe that refugee, uh, well, refugee numbers will scale up dramatically because of climate change, whether that's on their claim form or not. And are people prepared for that? Uh, yes, I believe it'll scale up. Yes, I believe it will be by the millions. And I worry about it um, every day. Um, when I think about what direction the world is going, um, the a lot of the future impacts of climate change are already baked in on the basis of past pollution. Uh, the idea that we um, uh, uh, will somehow avoid the consequences that we know the science tells us is always already going to take place uh, is a foolhardy approach. Uh, we need to be planning for continued mass displacement of people around this world. Uh, my hope is that we come to realize that this is not just a job for Canada, uh, but we can inspire the rest of the world to increase their ambition and do more on the international development side of things when you come to understand that part of the solution will be helping have the world remain livable for people in the countries where they are now. And part of the solution will be resettling those who have no future uh, in their country. And I love Dana's uh, comment, the, uh, uh, the, the certain hopelessness, I think was the phrase that you used. Um, we, we should expect many millions of people in the future will be displaced as a result of climate events and start adjusting our, our plan as a global community now. Anna. Yeah, thank you very much on this. I'd like to bring us back to, to Canada. Um, we know we have ambitious targets, but uh, I think there's two elephants in the room. One is that the people we have here usually don't find, unfortunately, in the first years of their arrival, they don't find the job that they've been trained to do. And I have a specific question on that that is said also from my colleague group of energy from TMU. Um, so are there specific initiative that, initiatives that the government is planning to put in place to help employers appreciate the skills and you know, experience of newcomers and you know address this problem of, of underemployment and de-skilling um absolutely uh and and i think we should all continue to do more not just as a federal government but provincial governments regulatory bodies industry associations employers um a lot of the attention on this issue is on foreign credential recognition which uh, i'll speak to in just a moment uh, but i had an experience visiting the um, newcomer center in in calgary a few months uh, back and uh, my eyes were open to a new perspective that being somebody who grew up uh, 10, 15 generations away from my uh, ancestors' migration journey to Canada, uh, that I just didn't think about as a white guy who uh, uh, didn't have a migration experience in my own lived history. Um, I was speaking with the uh, person who ran the center, and I made a comment about uh, the rate of entrepreneurialism we see with so many newcomers in Calgary. And she said, you know why that is? And I said, no, tell me. And she said, it's racism. Um, there's a lot of businesses don't hire people um, who look like me because they find people who look like you. And we're forced into entrepreneurialism, uh, not because it's what we wanted to do, but it's the only person who would hire us was uh, ourselves. 
And uh, my jaw hit the floor. Uh, talk about uh, the value of speaking to someone based on their own lived experience. Uh, I learned something that day that's going to stick with me for a long time. So through initiatives that we can fund that promote uh, acceptance and celebration of diversity, racial equality, and uh, education within uh, economic sectors about the value that newcomers can provide when they join the workforce will help us overcome the um, racial discrimination that will allow people who are qualified to work to work more quickly and at their full potential. But on the issue of credential recognition, uh, we need to fix this. Uh, we need to fix it in Canada, uh, uh, recruiting people from around the world, and we need to fix it as between Canadian provinces. So there's certain things we can do as a federal government. There's certain things that are other levels of government are empowered to do. What we have been doing as a federal government is trying to fund credential recognition programs, whether that's financing micro lending institutions who can pay up front for the cost of training. Uh, Windmill uh, is a wonderful organization that provides a great example. Um, but we also created a foreign credential recognition fund with $115 million specific to helping newcomers overcome credential recognition barriers. The challenge that I have is the vast majority of people who work in this country are not regulated by the federal government. They're regulated by provincial governments or more often by regulatory bodies who answer to the provincial governments. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping will provide an extra incentive is this category-based selection tool. Uh, what I've told my provincial counterparts, all of whom agree we need to address this, by the way, but have to sort this out with the regulatory bodies, uh, is that I don't want to do targeted draws for healthcare workers if you can't guarantee me that they're going to be able to work in a reasonable period of time. Uh, to the extent that they can solve their credential recognition barriers, that's going to give me the social license that I need to go do a targeted draw for doctors or nurses or a given professional in a particular jurisdiction. I'm hopeful this will start to have an impact in the la second half of this year, uh, but in the, uh, the long-term solution here is going to come through provincial engagement primarily with those regulatory bodies, uh, but they should know full well that the federal government will use its spending power to help, the federal government will use every element of soft power we can uh, uh, develop, and we're also willing to leverage this new category-based selection tool to reward the most forward-thinking provincial jurisdictions who overcome these barriers and set examples that others might be able to follow. I think that's interesting. I'm going to just jump in on, on that because politicians from all parties and all levels of government love to talk about this Canadian sort of touchstone about the nuclear physicist who's driving a taxi because of foreign credentials, and no one has really been able to make dramatic progress on this. So you're trying a carrot and stick approach, which which may work. But let's talk about the provincial nominee program, nomination program. It's it's jargon for the province is trying to tell you, since you said this a few moments ago, a chance for the province to tell you, here's what the situation is like on the ground. Here's what we need in Ontario right now. And strangely, incredibly, there is a federal provincial tug of war on this that goes way back. I remember when Jason Kenney was the minister and you're sitting in your shoes, and and uh, I remember asking him about Ontario trying to get more a higher number, and he said, "Well, you know, they they, they we we have the money, and and they'll just claim the credit." And there was just a lot of push and pull, and then he became premier of Alberta, and suddenly he loved the provincial nomination program. But Ontario has been clamoring for years about this because other provinces in the West and Quebec have a much uh, much higher quotas on this. So. Can you break the logjam on the provincial nomination program so that so that Ontario, Canada's biggest province, and 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 forty percent of the GDP can in fact get avoid this mismatch that we've had? Um, so look, there there is no perfect immigration policy, uh, but I think we can improve this situation. Uh, and in fact, with the uh, we just finished a few days ago the uh, um, midpoint meeting of the year for the Forum for Ministers Responsible for Immigration. And um, I can tell you, uh, uh, to, down to each jurisdiction, um, there was a sincere appreciation for the change in approach that we've demonstrated as we shared the provincial nominee program levels at a 44% increase this year uh, compared to years past. Uh, we are moving in the direction that provinces have been clamoring for, to use your language, for, for many years. Uh, one of the reasons that I think it was particularly um, uh, useful for us to do it this year, uh, because the circumstances have changed, is the Im immense uh, degree to which communities across this country are dealing with a short-term uh, gaps in their labor force. 
um, and the unique needs in Nova Scotia may not be the same as BC or in Ontario. Um, generally speaking, uh, I, I believe in the federal express entry system. It shows tremendous uh, economic outcomes in particular uh, over the life of the program. Uh, the Canadian experience class in particular has very, very high outcomes for people who can continue to work right away. One of the challenges that uh, keeps me up at night is the prospect that after a couple of really difficult years for businesses across Canada, um, their customers have finally returned and they're not able to fully bounce back because they don't have the staff or the talent to grow their business. If those businesses are going to fail because they can't get workers now, we're going to have wished that we didn't have such an aggressive pandemic response, which was very expensive, but was the right thing to do to keep them afloat to prevent that economic scarring that Minister Freeland often talks about. Um, the provincial nominee program will better position provinces to make decisions about how to get workers that can get into businesses that are in those uh, existential threatening set of circumstances. Uh, over the long term, once you get a few generations removed, it tends to matter less uh, who came in as subsequent generations show very similar outcomes across a range of immigration programs. So due to the unique pandemic related circumstances that led to the labor shortage, I think this was a unique opportunity for us to increase uh, the provincial nominee program levels. And my, my sense is my provincial counterparts have taken it as a sign of good faith. And uh, I expect uh, before too long, we're going to um, uh, show up in Ontario with our provincial counterparts to share a little more information about the specific uh, uh, arrangement that we've reached with the province of Ontario to highlight uh, the fact that we're moving in this direction. Well, that's two announcements you could make in the next 15 minutes if you want. Feel free. Uh, Anna, do you want to take another one off your list? Yeah, Minister, I'm, I'm a positive person. I'm an, a person that, that wants to see the glass half full rather than half empty. And I appreciate all, all that you said, but I, I hear the voices of civil society and also of my colleagues who are saying um, our system is half broken in that while we have all these good intentions and the plans that you said, we're not delivering as fast as a, and as efficiently as we should. And particularly that we are bringing in uh, significant numbers of international students, significant numbers of temporary foreign workers, but processing times for whoever um, has even, you know, the, the right points to transition are really long and, and people's lives are shattered as a consequence. What are, I mean, I know the, the IRCC is through a digital transition moment, but what can you tell us about the capacity, increasing the capacity of the government to process all the different types of files in the immigration system? Um, so just, uh, I, I would differentiate the um, uh, your comments in one regard. Uh, I, I don't think that the system is broken. I think it was overwhelmed. Uh, but the good news is it was overwhelmed due to an exogenous shock to the system driven by a, a few factors I'll describe in a moment, rather than fundamental problems internal to the system. Uh, though I think the system internally can be improved dramatically, I'm mean, happy to talk about that more if you wish. Uh, but if we're going to solve these challenges, which I agree with you are very, very real, we need to understand where they're coming from. Uh, the first driving factor behind the uh, processing uh, times being so lengthy uh, was a hangover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it doesn't take a, a genius to figure out things get challenging uh, when you're in the business of bringing people into a country when you close the border for public health reasons. When the border was closed, we kept receiving applications for both our permanent and temporary programs, while our permanent ones had pivoted to welcome people who were already in the country, and our temporary ones kept taking applications in hopes the border would open up. At the end of the uh, uh, border closure, we had a couple of years worth of applications in the system, which is not something the system is built to deal with. If you layer on top of that, the volume that we've seen come through as a result of our humanitarian response to Afghanistan and Ukraine, Afghanistan alone had more than 1 million expressions of interest of people who want it to come to Canada. Uh, when you add that kind of volume to the system that you weren't expecting, it puts very real pressure on it. And in the midst of the pandemic, Canada actually became the most popular destination in the world for a person who wanted to leave their country of origin to come to. So these three factors, the pandemic, the humanitarian response, and just the increase in demand really put intense pressure on the system. In order to get over some of these challenges, we're doing a few different things. 
adding an enormous amount of resources to the system. We've now hired more than 1,600 new people. Embracing technology, which uh, although the long-term digitization is a few years away, we're adding features both on the back end and from the client-facing point of view as they are ready so people can benefit from some of those uh, efficiencies and reducing some of the administrative requirements that we didn't feel were providing value. A great example would be uh, waiving the requirement for a medical examination for somebody who's been in Canada and had one in the last five years. That's going to remove that step for 180,000 people every year. These are the kinds of things that we can do that are going to speed up the process. They're starting to have a big impact as well. For new applica uh, applicants, for citizenship, we're back to about 11 to 12 months today. For Federal Express entry, we're back to six months. For family reunification, we're back to 12 months. Work permits and study permits around the end of this month. We expect to be back to 60 days for new applicants. And we have a little bit of work left to do, but later this year, I expect the 30-day visitor's visa standard will get back. The great news is when we actually get back to those service standards, because we've made a lot of process improvements and invested in the system, I actually have faith that we're going to be able to maintain those service standards or perhaps even beat them. But it's going to take us a few more months before everything feels back to normal because of the scale of the shock uh, that the pandemic represented, which I don't think is well understood by the Canadian public. But to people who go through the immigration system, uh, man, they feel it because they've been talking about missed weddings, missed funerals, not being able to be around their loved ones for sometimes a couple of years. These are very real human impacts that people feel. Uh, but I have a lot of faith because our projections demonstrate that with the exception of visitors visas, we're almost back on track across every line of business. Uh, and um, those lines of business are, are real people being reunited with families or making a contribution to our communities. So I guess the, uh, no matter how much you want to talk about substance in your ministry, it's always about process and processing times. Substance and process go together in, in your job. A question from uh, Julianne Burgess, um, who is part of a private sponsorship group. My question, in light of the devastating earthquake in Turkey, please tell us what specifically the Canadian government is doing to expedite the refugee applications of Syrians who are already in our system and who may be in danger of deportation back to Syria. Quick answer from you. Um, yeah, so any applications that were already in the system, we've been working to expedite. That was the very first thing that we did. We looked for everybody who was impacted by the earthquake uh, or would be Im impacted by it and tried to expedite those cases that were within the system. Syria is a particular challenge because so many family members of people who were resettled previously are here. So even though we're expediting them, it'll still take some time to get through. Uh, we're currently looking about what additional measures we can allow for people to come here temporarily to be with family members if they've been impacted. And I expect in the weeks ahead, we'll have some more information about what steps will impact those people uh, whose families might be in Canada already who've been displaced as a result of the earthquake. Okay, that's three announcements that you can make in the next few minutes. Uh, we're almost out of time. I want to just ask you, what do you think of uh, President Joe Biden's plan to send refugees back to the country of origin, to the safe haven, if you can call it that, that they might have been in, be that Mexico or some other place? Britain in the midst, you know, Canada is not the only country grappling with these kinds of news stories. Britain's also very much in the news with a plan to also send people who are crossing the channel. Uh, Britain just had the Brexit uh, adventure a few years ago when when public support for immigration crumbled. So what's what are your thoughts about what's happening in these two hotspots, Britain and the U.S. right now? Um, look, I, I try to be careful not to uh, offer commentary on the domestic policies of our uh, most important partners when I've got enough of my own challenges to sort out at home. Uh, but there's common issues that we, we do deal with. Uh, and just to put this into perspective so people appreciate what some of our allies are wrestling with, um, we saw last year 39,000 people uh, cross irregularly uh, at, uh, uh, into Quebec primarily. Um, the United States saw 2.3 million people uh, cross at their southwest border. Um, the order of magnitude by which their volume exceeds this experience that we've not really become familiar with until recently in Canada uh, is a, a completely different set of challenges uh, uh, compared to what we, we are dealing with. So um, what works for Canada may or may not work for the United States. Um, what I do think is essential, though, is that when you're dealing with a person who is presenting themselves to seek asylum uh, on the basis of very uh, vulnerable set of circumstances, you need a process by which you can properly assess that. 
Part of that process will involve partnerships with other countries in the world that a person may have crossed through where they could have been able to make an asylum claim. Uh, asylum claims are not designed to um, uh, be a, a place to sort of pick which country you go to. It's meant to welcome people who are fleeing very vulnerable circumstances. But there will be people who cross through those countries that may not have been safe in the country that they passed through. And you need to have a process that allows us, and this is not just a moral obligation, this is a legal obligation that we as Canada has have taken on, uh, both on the international stage and embedded into Canadian law, to have your uh, claim for asylum properly adjudicated on the facts. Uh, one of the challenges that we're dealing with, you talk about some of the processing uh, timelines across lines of business, uh, based on the increase in the number of people who've made an asylum claim, there's people in this country who are waiting a couple of years to get through this process. And by the time that they finish uh, uh, the, the process, they may have been working for an employer, they may have started a family here. Uh, so I think if we've got areas to improve as a uh, community of nations around the world, making sure that we can offer adjudication of asylum claims that is fair uh, and that is fast is an area where I think we can improve. Uh, but the reality is that this challenge is not going away. As we discussed in response to your climate question earlier, uh, the, the causes of migration in an increasingly mobile world where the pressures of climate and persecution and war are a reality for untold millions of people uh, globally uh, is something we need to continue to prepare for. Uh, I think part of the solution is going to be not just crafting strength and border policy, uh, but demonstrating how we can develop regular pathways that meet the interest of a migrant, but also serve the interest of host countries. Uh, Canada in particular launched a program a couple of years ago, the uh, Economic Mobility Pathways Pilot, to welcome skilled people who happen to be displaced. Uh, we're looking to expand access to that program in Canada, both by increasing the number of spaces and removing some of the procedural obstacles so we can communicate to employers, it's in your interest to hire a refugee, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because you can get them here in a way you couldn't do it otherwise. I think somebody's going to win a Nobel Prize for figuring out how to scale this idea. Uh, I'm convinced that as much as I want people to welcome vulnerable people out of moral uh, moral obligation to do so, I'm more interested that they do it uh, for whatever reason. And I trust people's sense of self-interest more than I do their sense of altruism. Uh, and in this instance, if we can scale this program and share it with the rest of the world, um, I will one day look back on my career and said I did something meaningful. Very much a long-term thinker here. Uh, it, it does sound, though, as if immigration and refugee and resettlement really are, at the end of the day, about scaling. I mean, it's great to it's great to bring people in, but it's scale. You mentioned the order of magnitude for what the American intake is, and of course, the number of Canadians or people in Canada who go to the U.S. Uh, in an irregular way is arguably higher than the number who come in. So net net, we're, the Americans are taking more from the north and a whole lot from the U.S. Uh, look, we're not out of questions yet, but I think we're out of time, and we did promise to liberate you on time. So uh, you're going to have to continue with your balancing act without us. So, Sean, thank you for joining us. Thanks also to my co-host today, the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration at TMU, Professor Anna Trianda Felidou. We're grateful to the Faculty of Arts for sponsoring today's event, and thanks to everyone uh, who joined us today. Uh, one quick plug. Uh, I'll be giving a talk tomorrow night on the power of media and democracy for the International Issues Discussion Series at TMU. You can get the details by looking it up online. Just search for TMU and IID. Uh, or if you're reading my column today, there's a plug at the bottom. Always plugging, always promoting, um, and promoting democracy. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and safe travels. Thank Thanks so much for having me, folks. Take care. Thank you.